the, the two insights that I had tonight. You actually you'll find this interesting, I think, because you've read Odyssey and you've read some of Plato. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> Plato and Homer are working out of the same tradition. Plato is copying Homer in many ways and uses a lot of his stuff. And I think that both of them were reflecting the same idea of paradox, which is a difference between high and low, or metaphysical and physical. And uh, Homer has this character, Odysseus, to travel between two dangerous spots. So he finds the center route through two dangerous spots in order to get his way home. And he does that over and over again. And one of the classic examples is the example of Scylla and Charybdis. So you have Scylla, who's a, a nine-headed beast, up in the cliffs above, and then Charybdis, who has this gaping mouth that sucks men down into a vortex in the water. <clears throat> but I think symbolically what we're looking at here is a trope, is a monstrous version of the same paradox that Plato brings up between the metaphysical and the physical, between the one and the many. So in the correct way of looking at it, the one is the metaphysical, is the divine realm, and the many is the physical realm, the realm of multifarious existence. But in the monstrous trope that Homer creates, the many is the many-headed dragon up in the cliff. So the nine-headed dragon, which devours the men, is the many, and lifts them up on high in a, in a monstrous trope of the actual uh, model. Whereas the one, which is the Charybdis, sucks men down into a vortex, which is, again, a trope as they go down into Tartarus rather than up. But you still have the same image of paradoxical movement through the middle of two different states, or two different um, contradictory states. And in Plato, that contradiction is, he suggests, the center of place where human beings have to live, that we can't live completely in the realm of the physical, but we can't live completely in the realm of the metaphysical. Uh, if we, for instance, if we um, live in the physical realm only, and there's only material existence, we completely neglect that whole realm of metaphysical afterlife, deity, all that soul. If we live in the metaphysical realm only, then we, we, we neglect all those things of the physical existence, and bodily um, necessities, and, uh, and, and even connections physical to other human beings. But Plato seems to suggest that neither one is the correct way. Both, when taken by themselves, become monstrous. The only correct way is in paradox, is in the middle ground between the two. So he's doing very much the same thing as Homer is doing, in that example of Scylla and Charybdis. The highest form then in Plato's divided line, which I don't know whether you got to that or not, but the divided line image which occurs in book six is uh, is basically saying that the movement towards the good, the movement towards the best, is only found ultimately through a dialectic, a contemplation of the forms he calls them, the logos. And the dialectic is frequently interpreted as a sort of conversation, like a question and answer sort of thing. But I wonder if he's not suggesting something instead of that, that dialectio is the two laws, the two readings. And the two readings there are the reading of the physical and the metaphysical, or the reading of the literal versus the symbolic, um, the, 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 the reading or law of the spiritual versus the material, that you have to have both in order to contemplate the good. If you try to contemplate the good with only one, you failed. It's only through that paradoxical energy that's created by being split in two different ways that you have two wings to fly with, so to speak. Yin and yang. Yeah, exactly. It's the same image as yin and yang in the East. Um, but the right one can't be overdeveloped and the left one can't be overdeveloped. You, you, know, you fly sideways like you know, a retarded bird. But um, <laughs> only with those two, both of them fully developed, do you have the wings to ascend? I like to make the joke that it's a, a flying sheep. You know, because you're above the herd, the sheep image that's used in the guy gets his ring. But you're a flying sheep with the two wings. You're like the golden fleece image. Um, only then can you ascend up into the realm of the, of the, of the good. But what that means, of course, is rather dangerous because what it means is that we have to believe, on the one hand, that we are completely physical, that there is no spiritual realm. There is nothing beyond this world, okay? And that's dangerous because alone it's very pressing, sad, um, dark. But we have to believe that and not have any recourse to say, but, yeah, really, we're spiritual. 
we have to believe completely or accept fully that we are only physical. But at the same time, we have to accept completely that we are only spiritual. Everything is energy. Everything is spirit. Uh, and by accepting that, we cannot say everything is spirit, but there's that material world too. Now you have to accept both at the same time without the assurance that there's the other one, um, which is very difficult to do. Now, I think as human beings, we always want one or the other. We don't want to be really material with maybe a little bit of spiritual or really spiritual with a bit of material we have to get through. Or we don't want to think about it or we say, yeah, we're just kind of something we don't really want. But what Plato suggests is I think it's very, very uh, tricky because it means that we have to live in that dialectic two laws or two readings, like a book, at the same time. Every book, every myth, is literally what happens on a page, at the same time that it is symbolically something else. So Red Riding Hood really is a little girl who has a red uh, cape and goes through the woods to meet the wolf and has hair like a woman, and by the wolf, literally. But at the same time, symbolically, it represents uh, the loss of innocence and talking to, to the dark forces are into the future. So it is both at the same time. And that's how we have to live, Plato says, which I think is very intriguing. It's a very unique way, so far as I can tell, of reading the dialectic, because nobody else seems to suggest that. Everybody else is like, oh, it's just a way of questioning the answer. I don't think it's that at all. I think it's a way, rather, of 